So this paper, we have a level three diploma in accounting. And obviously this is the new syllabus from September, 2022. And this is one of the longest paper we have for the AQA 2022. So this is our new syllabus, AQA 2022. And the paper is called Financial Accounting. A preparing financial statement. So this is a completely new paper that we're going to do. Uh, that was before uh, uh, two module on AQ16 with the AAT or syllabus. So it will be a little bit longer because this is the combination of two module. But, uh, but the good news is like we have less question to answer in the exam and we have more time. So we have uh, exam duration will be long now but the question, number of question will be less. But of course, like the way they present the question, for example, 1A, 1B, 1C. So the question will have more in the exam, but the number of tasks will be less. Let's have a look at the exam uh, area and a little bit about this syllabus. So let's going to, let's have a look at our, the content, what we're going to cover from this course. So let's have a look at that. The first thing we can have a look here, uh, the content, and uh, we can see we have to complete almost 16 chapter. So we have 16 chapter to complete and we'll go very slowly. We'll go uh, one by one. We explain every single thing we have in each chapter. We need to make sure we understand everything and every single activities we have in the chapter, we're going to uh, complete that. So we have accounting and ethical principle, chapter number one from here we're going to look at our uh, the function for the financial accounting. So who use the financial statement? What is the necessity of that? Why they need to look at the financial statement and some ethical principles. Ethical principles is relevant to every single module. So for example, the ethics we're going to learn from this paper, we're going to use the same ethics to the next paper. So ethics is relevant in every level three exam or level four exam. Once you learn ethics, it will be helpful for any exam. In the exam, we'll have at least five marks from the ethics and it will be very straightforward. So if we understand how the ethics work, then we will get the uh, five mark easily from the exam. So you need to make sure you understand the ethics. Chapter number two, we have bookkeeping transaction. If you have done your level two with AAT, you have a module called bookkeeping transaction. So from there, you have learned the journals, the ledger account and accounting equation and which item goes where. For example, this items belongs to profit and loss account and this transaction belongs to statement of financial position. So you're going to look at the entity and the classification from chapter number two bookkeeping transaction. Chapter number three, we have purchase of non-current asset. Purchase of non-current asset. Non-current asset represent fixed asset. Uh, the asset the company buy with the intention to use it in the business, but not to sell it. So if the people, if the business have intention to buy an asset to use it in the business, but not to sell it. For example, you have any business, any sort of business you have, you need a computer to run this business. Now this computer is selling computer is not your business, but you need a computer to run your business. And for that reason, computer will be your fixed asset, like a furniture, like a car, this sort of asset, the business need, uh, for example, the van, the business need this sort of asset, but not uh, to sell this asset with the intention to make money, but to use it in the business. And we called it uh, non-current asset or fixed asset. Now, non-current asset uh, has to be used by the business at least one year. So when you buy a fixed asset, for example, or non-current asset, for example, computer, car, land and building, uh, this sort of asset, uh, you have intention, you're going to use it at least one year in the business. So this is the definition. So we have to use it one year and also like with the intention not to sell it, but to use in the business. So you're going to see what type of transaction uh, we can record on the non-current asset and how to record it. And the breakdown of everything, we're going to learn from chapter number three. 
Then we have a depreciation of non-current asset. The depreciation of a non-current asset. Now this is the reduction of the value of the non-current asset. Depreciation, some of you may be heard this word. Depreciation means when we have an asset, especially a fixed asset or non-current asset, this asset cannot be used forever. For example, if I have an asset, this asset have a useful life. And after that, I have to replace this asset. For example, if I buy a car or if I buy a computer, I will not be able to use it forever or maybe not, not be able to use like a thousand years. So after 10 years, 15 years or 30 years, 40 years, I have to replace this asset. So that means every year there will be some value going down from this non-current asset and we call it depreciation. So the process we follow to reduce the value of the non-current asset, we call it depreciation. Then we have a disposal of non-current asset. Now the disposal represents sell. Disposal means sell, sell of non-current asset. Now the reason we call it disposal because when we make a trading, so when you have a normal business, like uh, the daily activities we do in the business to buy something, to sell something, and we call it sales. Sales means the income coming from the trade. But when we say disposal, the word is a little bit different than sell. The reason we use this word disposal, disposal represent when we sell non-current asset. So for example, if I sell any fixed asset or asset that I can use more than one year, uh, this is called uh, disposal. So if I sell any non-current asset, we call it disposal. We don't call it sell because sell represent my daily business transaction. Then we have accrual and prepayment. This will be one of the uh, very important and a little bit difficult chapters. So we have to learn how to adjust accruals and prepayment. Accruals and prepayment normally year in adjustment. So what happened here, some of the transaction we don't pay immediately. For example, if we buy something from our supplier, we pay after one month. So it is possible my year is ended on December, but for the transaction of December, I paid in January, it is possible. So what happened, the transaction we have in the January, we buy something or sell something, the customer don't pay this month, they pay after one month, or I pay to my supplier after one month. So for that reason, we have to make some manual adjustment because from the bank statement, we're not going to see that we paid for that or receive from the customer. For example, if you look at our electricity bill, we always use the electricity first. And after that, we paid a month after because until I use the electricity, I don't know how much will be the cost. So for that reason, I have to wait until the month is end. And after the month end, I can see how much I have used and I can pay for that. So for that reason, uh, we have to adjust this balance manually and we call it accruals. And same thing could happen for the prepayment as well. So the prepayment represent when I paid something uh, in advance. For example, normally our car insurance or insurance, we paid in advance. So for example, if our year is ended on December for the financial year, and it is possible I paid up to June, I paid for the whole year. So I paid something that belongs to next year, not only this year. So I have to make the adjustment uh, by dividing how many months belongs to this year. So I cannot take something that belongs to next year. So this sort of thing, we have to make the adjustment. We're going to look at all of this on chapter number six, that is accruals and prepayment. Chapter number seven, we have inventories. Inventories is all about the stock. So when the company makes something, uh, it is possible they will not be able to sell everything. For example, if we make uh, 100 units, it is possible we can sell only eight units. So the 20 units we have on the stock, on the warehouse, we call the inventories. So how to record the inventories? What will be the value? How much are you going to show on the financial statement? We're going to see in chapter number seven. Then chapter number eight, we have irrecoverable date and allowance for doubtful date. This is very interesting because here we need to learn what happened if the customer 
don't pay. For example, if we make a sales to the credit customer, it is possible uh, some customer never pays. So after they buying from us, they said like, I'm bankrupt, I don't have any money to pay. So if this is the case, how are we going to uh, record that? So we're going to see like uh, what is the options we have and how to record the e-recoverable date or allowance for doubtful date on the financial statement. So you're going to see when you're going to write off and when we can claim back the VAT from HMRC. So this sort of thing is relevant to our e-recoverable debt and allowance for doubtful debt. Chapter number nine, we're going to look at the bank reconciliation, another important area. If you have done your bookkeeping control on level two, you already know what is the bank reconciliation. Bank reconciliation is all about the difference between bank and my record. It is possible that the bank said I have more money, but my record said I have less money. It is possible the bank said I have less money, but my record said I have more money. For example, Let's say you issue a check to someone, to a supplier. And when we issue a check to someone, we minus from our record. We said like this money is gone because I give a check to someone. But this person, for example, did not went to the bank. Let's say this person went to the holiday or somewhere. So he didn't went to the bank. So if he didn't went to the bank, what will happen? So the money will be still on the bank. So... On my record, I have less money. The bank said I have more money because this guy didn't went to the bank. And sometimes it's happened, he went to the bank last day of the month. So if he went to the bank last day of the bank, last day of the month, the bank will take three or four days to clear the check. So the bank statement will show I have more money because the money will not be clear until three or four days. So I'm going to see this amount maybe next month, but not this month bank statement. So for that reason, I have to find the reason why my record and the bank record is not matching. So in it not matching, I have to find the reason why it is not balancing. And to find the reason and to say like, oh, this is the reason it is not matching. It is called bank reconciliation. So I reconcile the bank with the cash book. And then we're going to see control account reconciliation. Control account reconciliation is all about sales ledger control. This is the credit customer outstanding balance from the credit customer. So when you make a sales, we make a credit sales. And of course, like this credit sales uh, uh, will have some impact. So for example, some customer didn't pay, some customer become bankrupt. So we have to adjust. And also we have some individual customer. For example, let's we have a 10 customer, uh, they are credit customer, uh, and I have um, like a 10 supplier, credit supplier. So when you have a credit customer supplier of whatever it is, we have to reconcile it. For example, I have a three customer, X, Y, Z. And from this three customer, I'm expecting uh, 300 pound, like each of them need to pay me 100 pounds. So three customer X, Y, Z, they have to pay me total 300. So we have an individual customer and we call them sales ledger. And when you make the total balance, we call it sales ledger control. So individual customer, we call them sales ledger. And on the general ledger, we call them sales ledger control because I need to know how much is the total outstanding balance from all the customer. Now, the reason we have to prepare both account for individual and the total, it is possible, it is possible, you have a lot of customer. For example, let's say you have a, uh, let's say if you think about the British gas, if you think about uh, the Lloyds Bank, if you think about uh, the uh, uh, energy company or Thames Water, how many, how many customer they have? They have a lot of customer, millions. Now, if your manager asks you, how much you're expecting from our uh, customer, then what will happen? Like if you add one by one, it will take a long, long time to add it all the customer balance to say this is the total outstanding amount from all the customer. And sometimes it will be impossible because by the time you are keep counting, maybe other customer already paid. So for that reason, we have to keep two account. One is sales ledger, the individual customer balance, and another one is sales ledger control, the total balance outstanding. Same thing we do for the supplier. 
purchase ledger and purchase ledger control. So from this chapter, we're going to learn how to reconcile the sales ledger to sales ledger control, how to reconcile the purchase ledger to purchase ledger control. Then we have the trial balance, error and the suspense account, another important chapter. So the trial balance, uh, uh, more or less, we know what it is from all level two. The so trial balance is the balances that transfer from the ledger account, which, which is a general ledger, remember that, not from the individual ledger. So all the GL or general ledger balances, later on, we move to the trial balance. So all the general ledger balances, later on, we move to trial balance. And after that, the trial balance should match Trial balance have a two side, debit side and the credit side. So the debit and credit has to match. Now for any reason, if it doesn't match, for example, debit side is 10,000 and credit side is for example, 9,000. For any reason, if it doesn't match, the new account will be created and we call it suspense account. So the suspense account could create because of the error. So we're going to look at all of this from chapter number 11. Chapter number 12, we have extended trial balance. Extended trial balance is basically uh, uh, the, the trial balance we prepare before we prepare our financial statement. So if you know how to prepare the extended trial balance, you are almost ready to prepare your financial statement because extended trial balance is the most important thing before you actually prepare the financial statement and submit to HMRC. Now on the extended trial balance, we start with the general ledger balance. And after that, we do all the adjustment and we remove all the suspense account and find the final balance. And this balance, we move or forward to either the profit and loss account or a statement of financial position. So extended trial balance will tell you everything how much is the profit for that company and how much is the net asset and the liability, everything we're going to see from the extended trial balance. And this is kind of uh, just like everything ready for your financial statement. And any suspense account we have, that has to be removed through the extended trial balance. And the next one we have incomplete records. Incomplete records is another interesting and quite long chapter that we're going to see. Uh, incomplete records is all about when we have to uh, complete some records because some information is missing. For example, let's say you have a client and this client said like, uh, I lost all my sales day book or maybe I never record anything how much I paid to my supplier. So if this is the case, for example, if they don't keep any record for any specific thing, for example, for purchase, for sale, for anything. If this is the case, then what have to do? We have to find another technique to find it out that figure. For example, one of your clients said, sorry, I never write it down how much I sell to my credit customer. So I don't have any book. I don't have any record. So you'll say, don't worry. I have a technique to find it out. How much was your actual sell? Normally when HMRC come for the investigation, if they don't find any record, so they use these techniques, incomplete records to make the record complete. So you're going to look at what happened if there are any documents missing, how can you find it out that figure? So all of this you're going to learn from our incomplete records. Chapter number 14, we have accounts for the sole trader. Now this word is quite common, sole trader. It is very much relevant to the self-employed. The only difference between the self-employed and the sole trader is self-employed, sometimes you just work uh, by yourself. For example, you provide teaching privately, uh, private tuition. For example, you can uh, work as a cab driver. This is self-employed. But when you take this one as a business, for example, you open a small chicken chip shop or you open a barber shop and you own this shop and when you take this one as a business we call it sole trader so rest of this thing the tax return uh, the way tax is calculated submission everything exactly same like sole trader 
and self-employed only the difference when you work is self-employed when you take this one as a business we call it sole trader or more or less everything is same the next one we have a uh, chapter number 15 this is accounts for partnership accounts for partnership will be a little bit detailed to know how the partnership business work in uk we have a two types of partnership business one the normal partnership business when two or more people decided to do business together we call it partnership so we have a normal partnership business and we have another form of partnership business this is called llp that is a limited liability partnership so the partnership business can be formed as the ordinary form so the liability will be unlimited it is also possible you can incorporate it your partnership business in the company house and you can form the llp that is a limited liability partnership so there are a few things we're going to learn from there what happened if the new partner join in the partnership business what happened if the old partner retire from the partnership business what happened if there's a create of the goodwill what happened uh, if the partner leave and uh, uh, leave the money as a loan all of this thing we're going to learn from there uh, including the partnership current account capital account appropriation account profit and loss account and financial statement so this will be another long chapter to learn and then we have calculation and interpreting of the profitability ratio so you're going to look at some ratio analysis ratio analysis is the technique very quickly understand the company situation so we have profitability ratio we have a uh, uh, gearing ratio we have efficiency ratio we're going to look at like for example if i like to know this company is doing good or not or this company financial situation is good or not uh, in five minutes, if I like to give a comment, for example, Tesco, if I like to uh, give a comment like, should I invest in Tesco or not? And in five to 10 minutes, if I want to quickly understand the financial situation of Tesco, I can look at the ratio analysis. And that will give me a very quick understanding what is the profit margin overall from Tesco financial statement? What is their liquidity position that means how much money they have right now to pay off the debt what will be the leftover and how much debt they have how long it take customer to pay the money how long they take to pay the money to the supplier so in five to ten minutes you'll be able to in a uh, comment and you'll be able to understand the situation by looking at the ratio analysis so we're going to look at that on chapter number 16. so this is overall uh, uh, briefing for uh, for our uh, uh, this course financial accounting and this is all we're going to do through our classes we're going to go we will do very slow we'll go uh, chapter by chapters question by question and i'm going to explain in detail so that we will understand it all right, let's look at a little bit about the exam criteria. So you can see here, this will be uh, the computer-based exam. So assessment method, computer-based assessment. So it will be the computer-based assessment. Marking type, computer mark, duration two and a half hour. So duration will be two and a half hour. And you have to answer six questions in the exam. So let's have a look. So we have six questions to do. So we have to score 70% to pass this exam within two and a half hours. And expected content, you can see here, we have this task is about using the day book and accounting for and monitoring non current assets. So 28 marks expecting from this area then um, adjustment this is mainly the accruals and prepayment we're expecting 14 marks from this area then extended trial balance we have 24 marks financial statement for sole trader and partnership 24 marks then we're using interpreting the financial statement using profitability ratio so we will comment on the ratio this is another 18 marks and uh, we have incomplete records 12 marks so this is all the marks and his all the chapters is relevant so you have to 
make sure we are very good on this area in order to get the full marks in the exam. All right, so let's move on to our uh, to our chapters now, and uh, these uh, books will be um, available on your EMS portal. If you log into the student portal, you'll be able to see this books and of course it will be uh, very much helpful to revise and you can always order this book uh, this book from bpp you can always order from the bpp website and uh, it's always better to have your book at goshen bank as a hard copy rather than you study online okay the first chapter we can see here we have accounting and the ethical principle so but this is chapter number one and uh, let's look at the chapter overview. What we're going to learn from this chapter. So we can see here, we have a principle understanding of the final account. Principles and underlying final accounts. User of financial statement. Now who used the financial statement? Now financial statement represent few things, but the two more important thing is the profit and loss account and the balance sheet or the statement of financial position. So from the financial statement, we can look at how much company is making, how much is the profit for this company, number one. And number two is how much is the asset for this company? That means how much is the asset, how much is the liability and the equity? So you're going to look at both on the financial statement. Now the question is uh, who is interested to look at my company financial statement and why? So we need to find it out that. So from uh, this chapter, we're going to learn that. So if you talk a little bit, for example, they said the primary user. So who used the financial statement? The primary user, they said investor, the people who invest money on our company. So they will look at our financial statement. Of course, for example, if you have 10,000 pound now or 100,000 pound now, and if you are uh, planning to invest in Tesco, Sainsbury, or Esda, or Tesla, any company, how do you decide? You cannot just guess like, oh, I want to invest in Tesco. I want to invest in uh, Sainsbury. You cannot do that. So you have to look at the financial statement. So the potential investor like to see how much will be the return from my investment. So if you look at the financial statement, you'll be able to understand which company have more profit. So if you look at the total profit, you see like this company have a more profit. You can look at the last few years. And if you look at like, oh, this company doing really good every year. So I should invest on that company. So for that reason, the investor like to see what will be my return if I invest on that company. And for that reason, they like to see your financial statement before they took the decision. The next one, you have a lender. Lender like the people who lend you money, for example, the banks or any other financial institution. Now they like to see your financial statement. Why? Because they like to see, do you have enough liquidity situation so that you can pay back the loan? So before bank approved any loan to your company, bank like to see, do you have enough um, uh, capital or your company is doing that good that you will be able to pay back that loan. So basically they will analyze your financial statement to look at how much loan you already have, how much is the debt you already have, what is the outstanding balance to your supplier, how much cash you already have, how much is your working capital. So they want to see everything before they approve the loan because they want the security of the loan. They want to confirm like if you take the loan, you will be able to pay it back. Then you have a creditors, of course, like creditors is the suppliers. So the creditors we have here, the suppliers. So before the supplier give you a credit, for example, for one month, two month, they like to see like you will be able to pay their money. For example, if you buy something on credit and after that, if you're not able to pay it back to them, so they will not be give you too much credit. Now, for example, you know that in business, we never pay something upfront we never pay something like in advance. First, we receive the good. So first we make an order, then we receive the goods, then we receive the invoice, then we make the payment. So we always make the payment after, not before. And for that reason, for that reason, 
obviously like this is very important to look at how much credit I'm going to offer to that customer. Uh, it depends what is the credit score and other uh, analysis. And based on that, the credit company they approve or the, or the supplier they approve, like you can buy from me up to 10,000 uh, with a credit of one month or two months, or you can buy up to uh, 20,000. It depends how big the company is and what is their situation. So they also want to see your financial statement to look at if you buy something on credit, you'll be able to pay for that. Then we have some accounting principle. We're going to see that. The uh, two more accounting, uh, the most important uh, principle that we're going to see, we called it uh, accrual concept. Accrual concept. Now, accrual concept or accrual, accrual accounting is a very, very common because in UK, uh, 90, uh, 99% company, they prepare their financial statement based on the accrual concept. Now, what is the accrual concept? As sometimes you call it matching concept, accrual concept, and the matching concept is, is the same thing. So accrual concept is means to match the transaction that's relevant to that particular year. For example, let's say if we, we have a financial year, January to December. So our business financial year is January to December, 12 month. And let's say we've done some transaction on December. Let's say we have used the electricity for the month of December, but we paid next year, January, even though, even though we paid next year, January, but still we're going to record this transaction this year, December. And this is called accrual concept. Even though we're going to record next year, but we have we going to pay next year, but we're going to record this year. So you have to match the transaction that comes under this financial year. Regardless, I paid the money, regardless, I receive it from the customer. For example, if I make a sales on December, I have to record on December, even my customer pay me after three months, regardless. So we don't have to consider that when the customer will pay to me, but when the actual sales is occurred or when the sales is happen, we have to record on that day, not when the customer is going to pay. This is the main uh, concept behind of the accrual concept. So you have to record the transaction when actually it's happened, not when actually you paid to your supplier or the customer paid to you. Then we have uh, qualitative of useful. There are a few things. This is not very common in the exam, but it is all about like the fundamental qualitative characteristics. So if there is an information on the financial statement, it has to be relevant. So you should not uh, present something that is not relevant to your transaction or with the business, faithful presentation. And obviously the information has to be correct and it has to be um, uh, the way it is present, it has to be everything accurate. Then we have some ethical quality characteristics. So we have comparability, uh, verifiability, timeliness, understandability. So this sort of thing uh, is uh, for the financial statement. So when you look at the financial statement, so you can compare. For example, when you prepare the financial statement, we represent two years at the same time. For example, if we are in 2022, at the same time, we show uh, 2021 as well. So that anyone who look at the financial statement, they can compare every single transaction, like how much was the sale last year and this year, how much was the purchase last year and this year, how much was the electricity last year, this year. So you can easily compare like is going bad or is getting better. And then verifiability, you can verify the transaction. Timeliness, it has to be on time. So any transaction uh, that is not recorded on time, it will not be very important, of course. Understandability, obviously you have to understand it. When you, when you read something, you have to understand it. Then we have ethical principle. This is the one you're going to look at um, everywhere. So in, in any paper we'll do, the ethical principle remains same. So we have a fundamental uh, ethical principles. So fundamental ethical principle is uh, there are a few fundamental principles we have from the ethics that we cannot compromise. When we said fundamental, that means there is a lot of ethical guideline we'll have, but something is fundamental. Fundamental means like this is very important and there is no way we can compromise it. So we have uh, objectivity, integrity, confidentiality, professional competence, uh, and due care, professional behavior. Now let's try to understand one by one. Objectivity is all about, we have to be always free from bias. 
So you have to be always fair in every situation. You should not give a favor to someone uh, because uh, he's my friend or uh, by, uh, by anything I have I've received some extra money or I receive a gift. So for any reason, I should not be biased. It has to be, it has to be always free from bias. As an accountant, we have to be always uh, feel like we are not taking one side because of some interest. So this is the main objectivity uh, principle we have. So we need to make sure like as an accountant, we represent ourselves in a fair way. The next one is integrity. Integrity represents the honesty. We have to be honest. So for example, if the client asks you how much will be the charge for this one? So you have to be very much transparent and explain everything. So you need to be honest to your client. So integrity represents the honesty. Confidentiality. Confidentiality represents you should not allow it, as an accountant, you should not allow to disclose the client information to anyone without the client permission or it is unless necessary by the law or the, it is, if it is a threat to the public interest. So for example, if you have a client, you are not allowed to share the client information even to another accountant or to the family member, not to anyone. The information has to be keep confidential. Also, uh, obviously uh, without the client permission, you cannot tell anyone. So only the one situation you have to tell this information when it is uh, asked by the authority. For example, if the HMRC ask you any information about the client or the court ask you any information about the client, then you have to tell it, number one. Number two is if it is uh, against the public interest. For example, if you know your client is doing money laundering, if your client is involving something that damaging the environment, so this sort of thing, uh, only you are allowed to tell to the authority. Other than you are not allowed to share the client uh, information to anyone. Professional competence and due care. Professional competence and due care is all about when uh, you providing services to your client, you need to make sure you have enough, you have enough experience and resources to provide the best service to your client. So if you think you are not expertise enough, or if you don't have enough experience to carry on this work, or you will not be able to provide the best service to the client, then you should not accept that engagement or should not take that work from the client. So when the client asks you like, can you do some audit for me? And if you think like you don't have enough experience on the audit, you should not take it. If a client said like, can you do this work for me by tomorrow? And if you know you are very busy and if you rush, there will be a mistake and the work will be not qualityful, you should not take it. So it's very important to understand if you don't have enough resources or if you don't have enough time or anything and you believe you cannot provide the best services to the client, then you should not accept that client. Then professional behavior. Behavior has to be professional. So for any reason, we should not damage the uh, uh, reputation for individual or the institution. So you need to be careful with that. So um, just take a uh, two minute break. Uh, I think like, um, uh, just like uh, having uh, uh, something. Uh... So the professional behavior, who was talking about that. So professional behavior is all about when um, we have a situation and we have to, uh, take a decision and uh, when our behavior is not professional enough and that will damage our reputation. For example, for, uh, let's say like if we have done something wrong as an accountant, so it will not only damage our personal reputation, but also will damage our institutional reputation. Let's say, for example, if you are uh, get caught and uh, you because you driving uh, to um, uh, like uh, to a speed or they, they give you a fine or something. And uh, if you're an accountant or if you're a teacher, for example, on the next day on the newspaper, it will not only say like uh, uh, the person uh, name, 
it will also say like the accountant uh, uh, this person name is mr uh, for example simon and he's uh, he's an accountant and he involved with this bad thing so it will not only damage your uh, personal reputation it will also damage the institutional reputation as well so as a as an accountant uh, we have to make sure like we are not doing anything or we have to behave professionally so that it not damage our professional reputation also like um, in every situation for example let's say you went to play football and on the football ground your friend asking some advice on the taxation now obviously this is not the right place to give advice to your friend about the taxation and for that reason uh, for that reason we have to uh, make sure we don't give any advice uh, where it is not appropriate it is not professional behavior all right, then we have a few more things. Uh, the primary uh, financial statement. Now, the financial statement have five parts. Five parts. So if someone asks you uh, how many parts the financial statement uh, uh, we have, we have five parts to the financial statement. The first one is a statement of financial position. That is the balance sheet. We show the asset and the uh, equity and the liability. Then we have a profit and loss account. Here, we're going to look at how much is the profit and loss the company have. Then a statement of changes in equity. Here, we're going to look at what is the movement of the equity. For example, how much was the equity and how much was the share premium, share capital, capital and the revolution reserve, written earnings. So for example, if we pay any dividend, our written earnings will go down. So this sort of thing is not very important in level three because you're going to learn all of this in level four. So it is not very important, but for the time being, all you have to know, we have five parts on the financial statement. Then we have a statement of cash flow. Here we're going to look at, like normally we look at how much is the cash actually business have? Because when you prepare the accounts, we prepare the accounts based on the accrual concept. Now accrual concept represent only the transaction that relevant to that period. But accrual concept does not consider how much cash the business have. Now, sometimes it is possible the business shows a lot of profit on the profit and loss account. But when you look at the bank account, you see there is no money there, it is possible. So for that reason, we have to know like, uh, uh, what is the cash flow situation for that reason you have to look at another accounts and it is called cash flow statement and there we only look at how much cash into the business and how much cash out from the business and how much cash we have left on the business so it's very important just not to look at the profit and loss account because profit and loss account can be manipulated because they want to get some advantage it is possible anyone can do some manipulation with the profit and loss account and that's why we also have to look at the cash flow statement the last part of the financial statement we called it notes to the financial statement notes to the financial statement is all about notes to the financial statements is all about the explanation the explanation explanation means like what is the meaning of different accounting terms for example let's say we have a depreciation the trade receivables trade payable this sort of work if someone from non-financial background, let's say someone never study accounting, they will not understand it. So for that reason, we have to explain what does that mean? So we prepare another note, there we just explain the meaning of each accounting word and we called it notes to the financial statement. So if anyone reads something and if they don't understand the meaning of that, they have to go there and look at like, what is the meaning of that so that they can take the best decision by reading the financial statement. So this is the story we have for chapter number one. So let's go inside of the chapter and let's have a look what question we have. We're going to solve it together. All right, so let's move on to our uh, maybe first activity. So we have the first activity here. Activity one, user of the financial information. The user of the financial uh, information, as I said, like before we said that information that is like, uh, important to each of the uh, people who is uh, relevant to the financial statement. For example, the manager. Now, obviously, if I like to see why manager need to look at our financial statement, what he want to see from there. As I said before, the manager is the employee for the companies. So he want to see 
uh, if the is the company doing good, he will get the bonus from the company if the company fulfills the target or the job security. So for example, manager like to see, is my job is secure? If the company doing good, maybe he feel like my job is secure. Job security. Maybe the bonus. Because if the bonus is like uh, uh, based on the target, if the company fulfilling the target or not. So this sort of thing, manager going to look at. Employee also look at the job security, job security. Is the job is secure and uh, the company long-term growth and uh, obviously like any sort of retirement benefit, this sort of thing they're going to look at. Uh, they want to know uh, by looking at the financial statement. Then have investor, this one we said, like they want to see how much should be the return. How much you return or profit they will get from the investment and what is the future prospective growth for the company. So they want to look at that from the financial statement. Lenders, you already talked about that. Lenders like a bank or other financial statement, they want to look at like, a, uh, if I give a loan to this company, is the company will be able to pay it back. So, ability ability to pay back ability to pay back the loan so ability to pay back the loan and if there any liquidity situation the company have like if the company is not financially okay they can see from there as well the supplier want to see uh, uh, the company will be able to pay for the supplies or for the purchase. So will be able to pay for credit supplies. Then the customer, the customer is want to say like uh, 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 the company is doing some uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility. So is the company anything going, doing something good or the quality of the product or the company can run for the long time. So supply of product. Nowadays, some customer look at if the company do something for the society, they may be feel good to go to that customer. For example, Tesco, they said like, they give some charity to save, um, to Cancer Research UK. Uh, another company like Tesco Sainsbury, they give some charity to the Save the Children or UNICEF. So there's a lot of company UK, they fulfill some CSR now, corporate social responsibility. So they, on, they feel like it is not only uh, we are here, to do the business but as a business we have some responsibility to the society as well so there is a lot of uh, company they fulfill this sort of uh, social responsibility sometimes the customer uh, get attracted because of that and they go to that uh, that business or that uh, supplier to buy the thing because they feel like they are doing more for the society so for all this reason, uh, the, this uh, different sort of group, they want to see your financial statement. Uh, everyone have a different reason to read the financial statement. All right, so let's move to our next one. The next one we have here, accounting principle. We, um, we have some accounting principle. Let's talk about few important. The first one, we have a going concern. Going concern. Going concern is all about like when you open a business, we always assume the business will be continue for foreseeable future. That means when you open a business, we open with the intention that the business will continue for a long time or forever. So when we open a business, we never make a plan. The business will be closed in in after five years or 10 years. So it should not be with the plan when you open a business. So when you open a business, it has to be always assumed 
the business will be continue for foreseeable future. So for unlimited period. For example, if you look at the test score Sainsbury, they established 100 or 200 years before, but there is still running. So obviously, if this is the case, we understand the person who opened the business, he may be already died, he is no more, but the business is continue. And for that reason, we always treat the business and the owner are separate. So when you have a limited company, the business and the owner are separate, they're not together. So business will be treated like a person. So business will continue forever. So the shareholder, actually the owner of the business, they will change. So shareholder come from the grandfather to maybe the father to the son and it will carry on, but the business will continue. So people can die, the shareholder can die, but the business will never die. And this is called the going concern concept. So when we have a business, we assume the business will continue for foreseeable future. So if you read this one and say, the financial statement are normally prepared on the assumption that entity is going concern and will continue in operation for the foreseeable future. So it will continue for unlimited period. It will never stop. Hence, it is assumed that the entity has neither the intention or not to liquid or cartel materiality, the scale of its operation. So you're not going to liquid. Liquid will dissolve the company, close the company. So it should not have the, we should not have this intention when we will um, when we will uh, close this business. If such intention or need exists, the financial statement may have to prepare in different basis. And so the basis is disclosed. So if you already have a plan, the business is only for two years or five years. So you have to disclose this on the financial statement so that any user of the financial statement, they can understand your plan. But normally we never do that. Business always prepare based on the uh, going concern basis and we, we prepare it for foreseeable future. Accurate concept, we already talked about that. If you, if you quickly read that, it says, Accrual accounting uh, should be applied when preparing the final accounts. Under the accrual concept, the effect of the transaction over the event are recognized when they occur. So the transaction will be recognized when actually it is occur, not when actually paid uh, by the customer or by the supplier. This means that income and expense are recorded in the financial statement when the business has earned the income or incurred the cost rather than cash is received or paid. So we do not consider when the cash received or I actually paid to the supplier. We do not consider that. We consider when the transaction happened, when the transaction occurred, not when the actual money is paid or received. Income and costs are matched. So it has to be matched to each other. So for example, if I paid something in advance for the next year, I have to reduce it only for this period. If I have income that is relevant to next year, I have to also adjust that. So income and expense has to be only relevant for that particular financial year. So we have some other entity called business entity. Business entity, we just explained, business and the owner are separate. For example, this is our business. This is our business, for example, and this is the owner. The business and owner are separate, we have to remember. Even this person owned the business 100%, we call him shareholder, the owner of the business, the limited company, we call him shareholder, even though he owned 100%, but he's still he's separate from the business. So let's say when he start the business, he give 10,000 pound to the business. And later on, the business will give him back this 10,000 when the business will have a money. So the business will take this money from the owner as a loan when it is a limited company. So the business will pay it back to the shareholder later on until the paid is gonna be loan for the business, but they are separate. Business will be treated like a person. Remember that it is called separate entity concept, separate entity, separate entity concept. We called it separate entity concept. Separate entity concept represent the business and the owner are separate. All right, so let's move to the next one. And then we have some other thing. It's not very important. You can read this thing. 
on your homework time and uh, let's try we have one more activity cf activity two so let's try that so we have here it says indicate the conceptual framework qualitative characteristics that are being bridged in the situation the director the director have decided to move some expense from the cost of sales to admin expense now cost of sales represent the direct cost the cost of the product for example if i like to make this pen i can see the plastic i can see the ink so whatever i need to make this a pen like i need one hour to make it so the labor cost everything is our direct cost it is our direct cost and direct cost means the cost of sales now also to make this pen i need a lighting i need a heating i need to use a place so i have to pay the rent this is all indirect cost because i cannot see this rent or the heat and light on the pen so if i cannot see it it is indirect cost if i can see it it is a direct cost direct cost is a part of cost of sales then indirect cost is a part of the admin cost so if the director moves some cost of sales to the admin cost what will happen my cost of sales will be lower that means it shows to make a pen is take less money so it is less cost on the other hand my uh, my admin cost will be higher so from the tax point of view hmrc maybe will have no problem because we'll pay the right amount of tax uh, the tax but the financial statement user they will be confused they'll think how come the make one pen the cost is very less so they will be confused and they might think like oh it's very good we making a pen with the cheapest cost but they have to know actually it is not correct because you are moving the direct cost to the indirect cost so it is not very correct so we'll say this it will be very difficult for them to compare comparability comparability because before maybe the admin cost was low now it will be higher so that will be issue with the comparability and the cost of sales may, maybe last year it was higher this year is lower because you're moving the cost of sales to the admin cost so that's why it will be issue with the comparability and then we have here the accountant has a produce explanatory note which they are very technical and nobody understand what they mean. So this is the issue with the understandability. Understandability. So if you prepare some note and we use a very technical word, the people from the non-financial background, they have no idea what does that mean. So if this is the case, it will be the issue for understandability. All right, so let's move on to our next part. In the next part, we have the ethical consideration. We already talked about the ethics. And now we'll read some scenario. The five fundamental principles we always have to remember because in any paper, we have to do this five fundamental principle for ethics. So five, five fundamental principle of ethics. So the first one, as we said, professional behavior, professional, and then we have integrity, Then we have confidentiality. Then competence and due care. And objectivity. So five fundamental principle. And we have to remember uh, this five fundamental principle. There is, a, there is a word that will help us to remember the five fundamental principle of ethics. So the word is called Dr. Pico, D-R, Dr. Pico. If you remember this word, Dr. Pico, 
it will help you to remember the five fundamental principles of ethics. So P for professional behavior, I for integrity, C for confidentiality, C for competence and due care, and O for objectivity. So this five uh, word, if you remember the Dr. Pico, it will help you to remember the five fundamental principle of ethics. Now let's read this one uh, to find it out the situation, uh, what uh, the fundamental principle is thread here. So activity three, fundamental principle. Identify the fundamental principle being applied in the scenario below. All of the scenario take place with an accounting practice. Each scenario should be considered separately. So there is no link uh, of each scenario to another one. So it is completely separate. <laughs> scenario, fundamental principle. All accounting estimates, so such as depreciation charge, all accounting estimates, such as depreciation charge, are reviewed independently by two members of staff to ensure they are fair. So when we make sure two person checking one thing so that there is a no bias involved and so that we can represent in a fair way and <clears throat> we know it is relevant to our objectivity. So where the question will come about the fair, that means it is linked to the objectivity. So it said objectivity. Objectivity. So when it is linked to, it is fair, it is objectivity. And then we have employee are not permitted to make negative reference to the competitor when they're trying to win the new business. Now, let's say, for example, if a person come to you, a client come to you, and you should not give a negative reference to someone, say like, oh, that company is really bad. This person is really not good. So say something bad so that you can win that business. So this is against your professional behavior. As a professional person, you should not give a negative reference to someone so that you can win this business. So this is uh, the fundamental principle of professional behavior. So professional behavior. So this is uh, relevant to your professional behavior. The next one we have here, the new trainee accounting technician received training from an experienced supervisor before beginning the work. So before you start the work, one person receiving some training, and this is relevant to our competence and due care. Professional competence and due care. Competence and due care. So we need enough ex experience or expertise so that we can provide the best services to our client. A client has overpaid. The managing partner contact the client to notify him of this and issue a refund. So it is represent the integrity. When the client pay you more and uh, if you refund, and it is, it is relevant to integrity because you are honest enough to pay your client money back. So he said integrity. Integrity. Then we have no client detail may be disclosed. No client detail may be disclosed outside the firm without a specific consent from the client. It is relevant to confidentiality. So you are not allowed to disclose any confidential information uh, outside of your farm without the client permission. And this is relevant to your confidentiality. So only we are allowed to share the confidential information outside of the organization without the client permission when it is required by the authority, for example, the HMRC or the court, or if it is against the public interest, for example, uh, if the client involved with money laundering, or for example, if the client uh, damaging the environment, doing something bad, only that case. Otherwise, we are not allowed to share the client information to anyone. 
The next topic we're going to talk about that uh, the threats to the fundamental principle. Now we have five threats. Threats means there are some reason, maybe I'll not be independent anymore. So I'll be biased. So I'll not be free from bias. I'll do something wrong because there are five threats involved. So let's talk about these threats. The first one is self-interest. It is possible I have my own interest there. And for that reason, I'll do something that will bring me more benefit. For example, let's say if I become the auditor of Tesco and if I have one million pound investment on Tesco, so I will not do anything or I will not do take a decision that will damage the share value of the Tesco. Because if the share price Tesco fall down, I will be financially affected. And for that reason, I'll not do anything or maybe I'll not be fair to take the right decision because if the share price fall, then I will be financially uh, uh, not benefited. So for that reason, maybe I will be biased. So this is one of the reason I can do or I can take the wrong decision or not the fair decision. So this is self-interest. The self-review. Self-review is all about when I check my own work. So for example, I am the in charge of purchasing department. So I am the one who order everything for the business. So I'm the, I'm the in charge of purchasing department. And also I'm the one who authorized the invoice. So if I'm the one who check my own work, for example, if I order anything, and if I'm the one who authorized the invoice and make the payment, so no one will know what I'm doing. For example, if I order something that I, I order for myself, or maybe someone order for the personal use, but they put on the business. So this is the self-review. Or for example, if you are the accountant, you prepare the financial statement, and also you are the auditor who check the financial statement. So actually you are checking your own work. So when you check your own work, this is called a self-review. Advocacy. Advocacy threat is, uh, is raised when you act like an advocate for your client. So for example, let's say your client need a loan from the bank and you are telling the bank, I know this client, he's a very good, his financial situation is very good. He will be able to pay his loan back, nothing to worry, you prepare all the paper. So you are acting like an advocate on behalf of the client. You are not allowed to do it. So if you do that, maybe you will not be fair. Familiarity threat. Familiarity threat raise when we get too close to the client. So for example, when you start providing the services to the client for a long time, let's say for five years, 10 years, and you get too close to the client and you become like a friend. So even the client doing something wrong, you feel like he's like my friend and he will, you will not be able to tell it to the authority or if he do something wrong, maybe you will give the indication to him to tell him like, don't do it, it is not right, rather than telling the authority. So this has happened. So you'll not be maybe fair because he become very close to you. So when you get too close to your client, the familiarity threat raised. Intimidation threat. Intimidation threat raised when you feel pressure on you because of something. For example, your manager said, you have to do this one, otherwise the next year you're not gonna get the bonus. Or you have to do this one. For example, you, you have to claim all the VAT that you spend on the party, even though you know you are only allowed to claim the uh, VAT or the party for the staff, not for the customer. But maybe your manager have a pressure on you and said you have to do it. Otherwise, your next year performance or bonus you will not get, or maybe you'll lose the job. So for any reason, if you feel pressure on you, it is comes under the intimidation threat. Also, for example, if your client said like, oh, you have to reduce the fee, Otherwise, I will change the accountant or the person is very much powerful, said you have to do my work by next Friday. So if you feel pressure on you for any reason, it creates the intimidation threat. And sometimes maybe you do something wrong or not the right way because you feel pressure. So this is all the threats we have that make us maybe bias and we will not do the thing right way. All right, so let's move on to the next question we have, activity four we have, let's try that. So in the activity four, we can see here, we have a true or false question. 
indicate whether the following statements are true or false. Confidential information should only be shared with the other accountant in your firm. You see, this question is very tricky. It is look like it is true, but it is not true. Remember that uh, uh, it is it is not false. So confidence you only share with your uh, your firm. Now, obviously, uh, this is a little bit. I need to explain how it work. Uh, this one, uh, even though it says like uh, other accountant in your firm. Now, when you work as an accountant, it is possible there is a lot of member. There's a lot of member you have on your own accountancy. Uh, practice. Now, for example, if you are uh, work for the KPMG, you can see how many accountants they have a lot. Now, if someone work, if someone work on your team, then you are you can share the information. But let's say if someone work for another team, another accountant, even you both of you work for the KPMG, you are not allowed to share this information to the other accountant. Now, this is a very uh, important to understand. When you work in accountancy firm, doesn't mean I have only one accountant. There'll be a lot of accountants. Let's say I work, I'm the accountant in, in I work for KPMG and I, I handle Tesco. So I, I work for Tesco, Tesco is my client. And for the same, uh, for the same accountancy firm, for example, for uh, for KPMG and another accountant, he worked for Sainsbury. Now, if I tell this information to the another accountant who deal with the Sainsbury, so they will know like uh, confidential information and they might share the information like where Tesco buy the potatoes and all the vegetables at the cheaper price. So it could be like uh, have a negative impact to another supplier or the customer. So we need to make sure like uh, we don't share that. So even though it says like, uh, with the other accountant in your firm, I will go with the false, but obviously like, uh, unless it's uh, with the same accountant, we don't say it true. Now in the in the answer, you might find it true. Uh, it says uh, true, but uh, uh, obviously in the exam, if this question come, you should choose the false, not the true. It says should only be shared with other accountant in your firm. No, I will, I will not go for it because they didn't say with the same team. So uh, I will say uh, this one will go with the false, not true. Even if you see the answer on, on this book, it said true, but it is not true. It is it is should be false. The next one is say the same audit team being sent to client for several years can give a raise to a family trade. That's true because if I sent uh, the same team to the uh, same uh, uh, client for so many years and they become close, it will create the familiarity thread, and that's true. A gift from client can be accepted as long as they are uh, they are value under or below 100 pounds. That's not true, it's false. Uh, the gift is not allowed from the client. It will come under the bribery act, remember that? So we can only take the gift if it will not have any impact on my decision. For example, if your client bring a coffee for you, for example, if your uh, client bring some uh, lunch for you, and you know that because of this lunch or coffee, you're not going to change your decision. So if this is the case, only you can accept that sort of gift. Other than the gift is not allowed from the client. So it is there is no limit like, oh, I can take less than 100 pounds. Or I cannot take more than 100 pound no. So the criteria here is if the decision will not have impact on your, um, uh, if the gift have no impact on your decision, then you can take it, otherwise you cannot, simple as this. All right, so let's have a look what else we have. Uh, we have some ethical behavior. So let's read this one, it says, you are preparing the accounts for a client for the year ended 30 of June 2022. The business a dispatch good to a customer and raise invoice 29 June 2012. Is it 12? We are not 22, 12. However, the customer does not pay until 28th of July. So basically, the year is ended 30 of June. And the invoice is raised 29 June. So that means it's still on that year. 
According to the accrual concept, we don't consider when the customer will pay. If the transaction happened within this year, we have to record in this year, regardless when the customer is going to pay me. So the customer pay on uh, July, so I don't have to worry. So I know this transaction happened on 29 June and it belongs to this year, uh, June 20, 2012. Your junior colleague asks you why you are considering recording this sale in the accounts for the year ended 30 June when the cash was not received until July because of the accrual concept, because it will create our asset. If the customer said, I will pay you later, and if this year is ended, so on the year end date, this customer will be treated as a current asset, and we call the trade receivables. So if the year is end, and if the customer didn't pay yet, we create an asset account for that customer, because in near future, we're going to receive some money from that customer. So we call it current asset as a trade receivables. Which of the following can use in your explanation to him? You must choose one, okay. Acceptable, non-acceptable. The first one is says, the proprietor need to increase the profit. No, so I like to show more profit. That's why I want to record all the sales in this period. That cannot be the acceptable answer. This is unacceptable. The transaction is an expense to the relevant year. No, it is not an expense, remember that because I'm expecting some money from my credit customer. So it is an asset, not expense. The figure is a current asset at 30 June, 2012. This is absolutely correct. On this period, it is my asset because I'm expecting some money from this customer in near future. He buys something from me and he said he will pay you later. So I'm absolutely happy with that. All right, let's move to the next one. The next one we have professional behavior. Say so you are working as an accounting technician on the year end accounts. The following are situation where you must, uh, where you may have to record the adjustment. Okay, when you do the adjustment, all right, let's read this one. Which one of the, one of these would be appropriate professional behavior if action taken by you, okay? So let's try to do that. He said, a client sales manager wish, wishes you to record current accounting period credit sale made in the last month of the year. The bank statement show that cash was not received from the customer until the second month of the next year. This is absolutely true, isn't it? We know that, like for example, we have a year, January to December. Now let's say so we make some sale in December, sell. And uh, the customer paid on next year, January. Even though we make, uh, we make some sell 1,000 here, for example, on December, and the customer paid on January, uh, we're not, we don't have to worry about when the customer paid. This 1,000 we have to record on December for this year, let's say 2022. So you have to record in 2022, regardless the customer paid me on next year. So we do not consider when the customer paid because all the accounts we prepare based on the accrual concept. So accrual concept and matching concept always said, you have to see when the transaction is recorded, uh, the transaction is occurred, not when the customer is paid or you paid to your supplier. All right, so this is our story uh, of chapter number one. I think this is the end of the chapter. So we'll move to the next chapter. Uh, before that, we'll take a break. And uh, after the break, we'll take, uh, we'll move to the next chapter. Now the next chapter we have, chapter number two is it for bookkeeping transaction. Now, if you have done your level two, you already know what is there. So we have to know a few things from this chapter. We'll look at uh, the accounting equation. We'll look at some entity. And we have to say this entity belongs to a profit and loss account or balance sheet and uh, uh, so on. And top of that, we'll learn some ledger account from here. So let's go to the chapter number two, chapter overview, and let's have a look what we're going to cover from this chapter. So first thing we can see here, uh, they said like to identify the financial position. So a statement of financial position show the asset liability and the equity. So on the statement of financial position or the balance sheet, we can see the asset and the liabilities and the equities. So you have three things. 
asset, liability, and equity. So when you open the financial statement, we'll look at this three things there. And uh, on the profit and loss account, we see income and expense. So if I see something is relevant to income and expense, that means it is belongs to profit and loss account. And if I see something is asset, a liability or equity, then it is belongs to a statement of financial position. On the other hand, we'll see the accounting equation. On the accounting equation, we have asset um, minus liability called capital. So we already know that what is the accounting equation. So from the asset, if you minus the liability, the remaining will be capital. And the other way we can say asset plus um, capital is the liability plus capital is asset. Asset minus uh, capital is liability. So the best way you can remember it, we can make asset in the top and we can say it is a liability and we can say it's a capital. So if we add the liability and the capital, it will be called to the asset. So if we do um, liability plus capital, it will be called to the asset. And for example, if the asset is 100 pound and the liability is 50 and the capital is 50. Now, if I like to find it out, for example, how much is the, let's say we don't have the capital. If I like to find how much is the capital, so we do asset minus liability, that will give us the capital, 50. And for example, if I like to find how much is the asset, so liability plus capital is the asset. So capital and liability equal to the asset. And another way we can do, uh, always find the other one by minusing the next one. For example, if I like to find how much is the liability, we can say asset minus capital is the liability. Okay, and then we have some day book, the book of prime entry. So book of prime entry means uh, where initially we recorded any transaction. For example, uh, the credit sale, credit purchase, uh, any sort of like uh, receive uh, cash, um, like money in, money out, then if I give a discount, if I receive a discount. So any sort of transaction that is happening with the business day-to-day -day basis. So initially, where we recorded this transaction, we called it day book. And the some book are book of prime entry. The reason we called it book of prime entry because it is a very important and we have to keep this record. So if the HMRC asks you like, uh, do you have this information? You say, yes, I have this information. So we have to have this record. So when you open a limited company or if you do a business, you have to keep some records. Some records are very important to keep. That's why we called it book of prime entry. So the books of prime entry have sales day book. On the sales day book, we record only the credit sale. Remember that there is no cash sale come to the uh, sales day book. So sales day book, we recorded only the credit sale. Then we have a sales return day book. Sales return day book is all about only the credit sales return. And then purchase day book. Purchase day book is all about uh, the return, uh, the, the purchase, the credit purchase from the supplier. And then we have a purchase return day book that is a credit purchase return. Cash book. Cash book is all about only cash. Cash book is all about only cash. So how much cash into the business and how much cash out from the business. Then you have a discount allowed day book, a discount allowed day book. So a discount allowed day book where we record only the discount. Discount received day book, only the discount, how much discount we received. The journals, the journals is all about the debit and credit. So record the transition in the form of debit and credit. On top of that, we have some element uh, of the financial statement, accounting equation, books of prime entry, you know that, then double entry. Double entry means two entry. This is basically the journal. Double entry means every single transaction, we have a two entry, one is debit and one is credit. Then the VAT, value added tax. So uh, if you remember your VAT control account, so if you need to pay the VAT, it will come to the VAT control account on the credit side. If you need to claim the VAT on the debit side, and the, at, the, at the end of the period or two, you need to look for how much VAT we need to pay to HMRC or we're going to claim back. So normally if the credit side is higher than the debit side, then we have to pay the VAT. If the debit side is higher, then we claim back the VAT from HMRC. Then you have a trial balance. Trial balance is all about the ledger balances. And at the end of the ledger balances, we look at the trial balances match. So if the trial balances match, that means the double entry has been uh, taken place correctly. So in order to check all the ledger, uh, the journals, everything is recorded correctly uh, through the trial balance. So if the trial balance doesn't match, 
that means there is some error there's some mistake we have done and we can always go back and check and uh, find is there any error or the suspense account and correct it and match the trial balance again all right so let's move on to our uh, the questions let's have a look what we have here now this is the financial statement look like we can see here on the financial statement is statement of financial position we have uh, this is the format you have to uh, remember this format so you can see here we have asset now we have a two types of asset one is a non-current asset and one is current asset non-current asset or uh, sometimes you call it fixed asset so non-current asset is the asset that asset business we use uh, for more than one year and also the asset we buy with the intention to use it but not to sell it so if we buy any asset with the intention to use it in the business but to sell it we call it non-current asset and also this asset has to be used in the business more than 12 months or one year so property, plant, and equipment, and intangible asset. Intangible and tangible, there is two types of asset. This is called tangible and the intangible. Tangible asset means the asset we can see or we can touch physically. For example, computer, furniture, car, land, and building. So this sort of asset I can see or I can touch, we call it a tangible asset. On the other hand, the intangible asset is all about the asset I cannot see or I cannot touch, for example, the software, for example, the goodwill, patent, copyright, this side of this sort of asset, you know, the lease agreement, this sort of asset, normally sometimes if you cannot see or if you cannot touch, then we call it intangible asset. Then we have a current asset. Current asset, uh, we have inventory. So any asset, uh, if we believe um, in a short period or very soon, it will be converted into cash. So very soon or in a short period, it will be converted into cash. Uh, we call it cu current asset. Now on the current asset, we have inventory. Inventory means the stock. Uh, we explained before uh, any asset, any, any product, if it is not uh, sold uh, and if it is on the warehouse, we call it uh, inventories or stock. Uh, trade and other receivables. Trade receivables or other receivables means it is a credit customer. Trade receivables means credit customer, the people who buy from me, my customer, but they will pay me later. We call them trade receivables. And cash and cash equivalent. So if we have a cash or something is equivalent to the cash, for example, the check or money in the bank, this is equivalent to cash. So this is also my current asset. Top of that, we have some more current asset. For example, the prepayment, also the current asset. So if we're expecting, um, if we pay something in advance, this is my current asset as well. Then we have a liabilities. Then we have the same thing. We have a non-current liability and current liability. So the current liability, we have bank overdraft and the trade payable. Bank overdraft, when we use the bank money for a short time, we call it bank overdraft. And the trade payable, when we have a credit supplier, when we have a credit supplier, when you have a credit supplier, and then obviously called it trade payable. And uh, uh, this money has to be paid very soon. That's why it's a current liability. We have a non-current liability as well, but it is not relevant to our uh, sole trader sometimes. But the non-current liability is the liability that I have to pay more than one year time. For example, um, for example, the bank loan, for example, the mortgage that we paid more than one year, we called it non-current liability. Then we have a net asset, this is the format. So from the, we have a uh, non-current asset, then the current asset minus current liability. Current asset minus current liability, then this gives us the net current asset. From the net current asset, we add the non-current asset and that give us the net asset. And the net asset has to be linked uh, or equal to the closing capital. The formula we have to remember to calculate the closing capital is opening capital, this is from the trial balance, then add the profit for the year. That's from the profit and loss account. So how much profit do we make on the profit and loss account? We have to record it here and uh, we have to minus the drawings. So drawings means if uh, the owner of the business, if he take any money for his personal use. So if the owner take any money from the business for his personal use, you call the drawings. So you have to minus the drawings because drawings will reduce his total capital, whatever he invested at the beginning. 
and that will give us the closing capital and the closing capital has to be equal to our net asset always remember that closing capital has to be always equal to our net asset all right let's move to the next one there is some definition uh, what is non current asset current asset we explained that already now look at the format for our profit and loss account a profit and loss account here only the income and expense are relevant so we need to look at how much is the income income is called sales sales revenue sometimes we call the income sometimes we call turnover same thing sales revenue income turnover so you have to start with this one then you minus the cost of goods sold the cost of goods sold have a formula that is opening inventory plus purchase less closing inventory you have to remember that opening inventory plus purchase less closing inventory is the formula for cost of goods sold or cost of sales so once we minus the cost of sales from the sales we we have the difference and we call it gross profit so gross profit means sales minus cost of sales and from the gross profit we add if there any other income that is not from the trading not from the business for example sundry income sundry means like if something income come from the different source then we have a uh, discount received so if we have any sort of income that not from the trading we're going to record here uh, after the gross profit and that will give us the total uh, income here or total profit then you have to minus all the operating expenses so operating expenses means to run the business we have to spend some money for example, uh, all the indirect cost or overhead. For example, rent and rates, telephone, electricity, wages and salary, motor expense, discount allowed. All of this, it is of my operating expenses. And we have to minus all of this to find it out how much is the net profit. And this profit later on will be added with the capital on the financial statement SOFP. So this is the format. If you uh, read a little bit, if you try to memorize it, it's not that difficult. So you will be able to do that. All right, let's move on to the next one. Then we have uh, classifying the item. So show whether the following item are asset, liability, capital, income or expense. So we have to read the transaction and you have to say uh, entity you have to say is it asset liability capital income or expense if it is asset liability and capital it belongs to SOFP statement of financial position if it is an income and expense it is belongs to profit and loss account income and expense always relevant to profit and loss account Okay, the first one is the trade receivables. Trade receivables is asset. We always say trade receivables means the credit customer, the customer going to pay me in future. They are my asset, they're my current asset. So I say this is my asset. And if it is asset, it belongs to SOFP. SPF, a statement of financial position or SOFP, same thing as FP. The capital. Capital is capital. There is no definition for that. Capital is the money investment invested by the owner at the starting of the business. So capital belongs to SFP as well. And then we have a sales revenue. Sales revenue is income. Sales revenue is income. Sales is always income and it belongs to SPL, profit and loss account, a statement of profit and loss account. Bank overdraft is a liability. If I use the bank money, I have to pay it back. And the liability belongs to SFP or SOFP. Wages expense is expense. Income and expense belongs to profit and loss account, so SPL. Then intangible asset is asset. Regardless, it is tangible or intangible. Asset is asset, belongs to SF. P statement of financial position. Cost of sales is a expense and belongs to SPL statement of profit and loss account. So we have to understand by reading the transaction: is it an income? Is it an expense? It is asset? Is it liability or capital? And we have to know 
where is the destination, where it will go. It will go to the uh, profit and loss or it will go to the statement of financial position. So the classification is first thing that is very important. All right, let's move to the next one, the accounting equation. I already said how to do the accounting equation. So we need to remember A is the top, asset will be on the top and L and capital is there. If I plus L and C, it will be equal to the asset. That's all we have to remember. So for example, if my liability is 50 and the capital is 50, then the asset will be 100, quite simple. All right, let's move on to our next question. So let's try the activity two. Let's try to do this one. So we need to, let's write this one, A, L and C. L plus C, capital plus liability equal asset. Let's try to do this activity to accounting equation. Show whether the following statements are true or false. The first one is says capital equal asset plus liability. They said C equal to A plus L. That's not true, that's false. A represent the total, A is the bigger one. A means L plus C. Asset plus capital is the liability. No, that's not true as well. Capital plus liability equal asset, this is true because capital plus liability equal asset, this is true. Number B is says, answer the following question by entering the appropriate figures. If liability is 39,000 and capital is 51,000, what is the amount of asset? So liability 39,000, capital 51. So 39,000 is a liability plus capital is 51. They are saying, how much will be the asset? It's quite simple, we need to just add this two. So if 39 plus 51 is 90,000. So 90,000 is the asset, very simple is this. Then if asset total 86,000, and liability for how much is the capital? So we need to do asset minus liability is the capital. So asset means it is basically the total of these two. So if I want to get anything else, I have to minus it. So asset minus liability is the capital. So 86,000 minus 44,000, that will give us 42,000. This is our capital. And if say, it says, if the capital is 74, asset is 162, how much is the liability? Again, the same thing, asset is always the total. So asset minus capital, 162 minus 74. So 88,000 is my liabilities. It's quite simple. If you understand this one, asset uh, liability plus capital equal asset, that's quite simple to do the workings. Okay, the next one we have here. So the owner of the business withdraw some cash from the business for personal use. They so said drawings. How will the element of accounting equation will affect by this transaction? So if the owner of the business take any money, withdraw means take some money, uh, cash from the business for personal use, we call it drawings. Remember that drawings will always reduce the capital. And if the capital is goes down, asset will go down because capital is the part of the asset. So if the capital is goes down, total asset will go down and also it will reduce the capital. So he said asset will decrease because if it is like take someone money from the business, total asset from the business will go down, the bank will go down. Liabilities will remain same, no change because it is not the liability and the capital will go down because if the owner of the business take any money from the business that will reduce his own capital. The total investment will go down. So capital will go down. All right, let's move to the next one. The next one we have here, books of prime entry. We have talked about that, sales day book, sales return day book. You can read this one. Make sure you read all the chapters. It will be very helpful uh, to understand more uh, let's look at the next one, what we have here, activity four. Or the illustration four here, let's look at the activities. General ledger, debit and credit. So if you don't understand uh, how the debit and credit work, we need to make sure you uh, uh, understand it because the debit and credit is the very basic thing. 
And uh, we have to remember this uh, formulas to identify what is debit and what is credit. So we call it dead or click. So debt means like D for debit, E for expenses, A for asset and D for drawings. So when debt increase, this is debit. And when debt decrease, this will be credit. So for example, if my expenses go up, asset is going up and the drawings is going up, that will be debit. If my expense is going down or asset is going down and the drawings is going down, that will be credit. On the other hand, we have a click. So we have a click credit. So C for credit, L for liability, I for income and C for capital. If the click goes up, that will be my credit. For example, if my liability goes up, if my income goes up, if my capital goes up, that will be credit. And if it is going down, that will be debit. So you need to make sure you remember this one, dead and click formulas. And there's a lot of videos you'll have on the YouTube for understanding the debit and credit. Make sure you watch if you don't understand how to calculate the debit and credit. And then we have double entry bookkeeping. So on the double entry bookkeeping, we need to find it out how to do the debit and credit and we have to record on the ledger account. So let's try to do it. We'll do very slow and we will understand how actually it is work. Let's do the activity three. Double entry bookkeeping, even the question didn't ask for the uh, journal, but it will still do some journal to understand the debit and credit. Let's start with the first one, number one. Number one says, it started business by depositing 30,000 into the bank account. So you start a business depositing 30,000 into the bank account. Remember that when we start a business, it's always capital. When you start a business, it's always capital. So we have, if we deposit the money to the business bank account, so bank will go up. If the bank is go up, then asset will go up. Asset is come under the date. If the asset is going up, that is debit. So bank will be debit bank will be debit because bank will go up 30,000 and bank is my asset and capital is credit. The reason it is capital because it is started, starting out the business. 30,000 credit and capital is always credit. Remember that. So first journal we done, bank debit, capital credit. Number two, brought good for resale and paid 800 by check. Remember that check is always linked with the bank. If anything happened with the check, that means the money will go down from the bank. If I pay anyone through check, so money will be reduced from the bank account. So good for resale and paid 800 by check. So brought good is a purchase, I buy some goods. So purchase will be debit. Yours purchase will be debit 800 pound expense will go up that's why purchase is debit and uh, our uh, bank will go down because if i pay by check the bank will go down so bank will be credit 800 purchase is debit bank is credit Then paid rent 500 by check. Paid rent 500 by check. Number three. So rent is expense. So rent will be debit. Rent debit 500. Paid rent 500 by check. So rent is expense. So rent will be debit and paid from the bank, paid by check. So bank will be credit. Anytime if you see paid by check, that means the bank will be credit. Oh, I love that. Then number four, sold good for 400 and customer paid directly in the bank account. So our bank will go up. If the customer paid to my bank account, business bank account, my business bank account will go up. So we said 
the bank will be debit because bank will go up bank debit 400 and sales credit sales is income if i make a sales my income will go up and the, the click will go up that's why sales is credit sales is always credit number five paid rates 150 by check now rates means it's like a business of rates so the way uh, we pay council tax to the council a business pay the same thing but we called it business of rates when you pay for the house you called it council tax but when the same thing pay by the business we called it business rates number five so rates is a debit rates debit one five zero and paid by check so bank is credit credit one five zero then we have a sole goods on credit to customer b brown for 150 this is a little bit tricky when we sell a good on credit credit means the customer will pay me later uh, always uh, there is two type of transaction one is cash or credit cash means when the customer pay me immediately right now when you make the sale for example if you go to test we buy something and you pay for that immediately that's a cash transaction but if the customer said, I'll pay you later, we call it credit transaction. Now, when you have a credit transaction, there's a new account to be created. We call it sales ledger control, sales ledger control or SLC. So sales ledger control will be debit. And this is my asset. In the future, this customer is going to pay me 1150 and the sale is credit because sale is income. 1150. And the last one we have number seven. This one we have brought good for resale on credit from Y Healer for 450. So that means it is a credit purchase. So purchase is debit anyway. There you are. Purchase is debit, is expense. That is 450 but I'm not paying immediately is a credit purchase. For that reason, purchase ledger control. It's like a sales ledger control, PLC. Purchase ledger control, the liability account will be created. That's our credit, 450. All right, now our journal is done, debit and credit is done. Now we'll be able to record it on our ledger account. So you're going to see how to record it on the ledger account. So let's do the first one for the bank. If I'll show you one and rest of will be your homework to do. It is very easy if you understand one so that you can do rest yourself. So we have, the first one we have a bank. So you need to look at in every single transaction where we have the bank and we have to record all the transaction where this account belongs to bank. The first one, number one, we can see bank is a debit. Remember that the left hand side is the debit side, the right hand side is the credit side. So bank is a debit, that means I have to write on the debit side, but I have to write the opposite. I always write the opposite. For example, bank is a debit and capital credit. So I'll write capital, not the bank. Why? Because this account belongs to bank. We do not write the name account holder. So this account belongs to bank. We do not write bank inside of the bank. So we write capital on the debit side because bank is a debit. Capital, that is 30,000. That's it. Same thing we do for the next one. Number two, we have a bank. This time bank is a credit. So you're going to write on the credit side, but we write opposite, we write purchase. Purchase, this is 800. Number three, bank is a credit. So on the credit side, we write opposite rent. 500. Then number four, bank is a debit. So on the debit side, we're going to write sell. That is 400. Then number five, 
Number five, we have bank as a credit. So on the credit side, we're going to write a rates. Rates. And this is 150. There's no more bank on the six and seven. So our bank is done. Now, this is the one we record on our ledger account, general ledger. So now we have to add the higher side, debit and credit side. We need to look which side is higher. So it's look like debit side is higher. This is 30,400. We're going to write 30,400 on both side. Remember that the higher side we need to write on the both side total. After that, we have to minus the credit side because it is not 30,400. We have to find the difference. So we have to minus. So we said we have 30,400 minus 800 minus 500 minus 150. And that gives me 28,950, 28,950. And we called it balance CD. That means closing balance. So this is the way we do every single ledger account. So first we complete the journal into the uh, ledger boxes. And after that, we see which side is higher. And from the higher side, we take our, um, uh, from the higher side, we write on the both side on the total. After that, we minus the lower side. And the difference we find, we called it balance city. Now, what we understand from this account, we understand on the bank, we receive 30,000 because of the capital. We receive 400 because of the sale. And from the bank, we paid 800 because of the purchase. We paid 500 because of the rent and we paid 150 because of the rates. And right now on our bank, we have 28,950 left. So obviously if your manager asks you how much you received, because of what, how much you paid, how much you still have on the bank, you will be able to answer any question by looking at the bank account, ledger account. So that's how we have to complete all of this. So rest of this thing, we have a box. So it will be your homework. So you can do it after the, uh, after the lesson. So you will be able to complete all these boxes. All right, then there is a balancing off. I think it is not very difficult. This is the balance CD and BD. We already talked about that. Now we talk about the VAT control account. Let's talk about our VAT control account. Now the VAT control account is quite simple. So we have, we have to remember uh, what comes to the debit side and what goes to the credit side. So normally the opening balance is a liability, balance BD. It's a VAT control account. So normally the balance BD or opening balance is a credit balance because it's a liability we have to pay to HMRC. So it's a liability, that's why it is credit. Then if we make a sales, so you have to pay the VAT. So liability will go up. And if there's a purchase return, that means if I buy something and I claim the VAT, but if I return that, I have to pay the VAT back. So I have to pay the VAT to increase my liability. Then discount receipt, if I receive the discount from my supplier, I cannot claim the VAT on that, so it will come as well. This four thing normally come to the credit side. And on the debit side, we have VAT on purchase. So if I buy something, I have to pay the VAT, so it will be on the debit side. Remember all this figure here, all are VAT, not the sales and not the purchase, only the VAT will come to the VAT control account. Then VAT on sales return. So if my customer return to me, I'm not gonna pay VAT on that because customer return, it will come to the debit side. VAT on discount allowed, that means if I receive a discount, obviously like I'm going to record here, discount allowed, uh, if I, if I uh, allow discount to my customer, I'm not gonna pay VAT on that because the customer never paid this amount. Then the bank, bank means any VAT already paid, any VAT already paid to HMRC from the bank. So if I paid all the DNA VAT, that will reduce my liability, that will be on the debit side. And after that, the balance CD represent how much I still need to pay to HMRC. So whatever is the balance CD, the same amount will be balance BD. So whatever is the closing balance for this period is the opening for next period. So this is the formula or format we have to remember for our VAT control account.
Let's move to the next one. The next one we have here our our uh, trial balance. So let's have a look what we have in the trial balance. Trial balance is all about to find it out is it debit or credit, nothing else. Trial balance is all about to find what is debit and what is credit. So let's try to find it out that what is debit and what is credit. So, okay. So we have here, okay. So we have here some trial balance. So obviously like all you have to know is it come to the debit or credit and at the end of the period it has to match. For example, bank is an asset, that's why it's a debit. Capital is a capital, capital or is credit, purchase the expense is a debit. Rent is expenses debit. Sales is a income is a credit. Rates is expenses debit. Receivables uh, ledger, it is our asset, it is a debit. Purchase ledger control is our liability, it is a credit. And after that, adding debit and credit, it will be equal. Always debit side and the credit side has to be equal. If it doesn't match, if it is not equal, the suspense account will be created. That we're going to see later on, on different chapters, how the suspense account created and how to solve it. All right, what else do we have here? Let's have a look. And uh, we have some advanced bookkeeping knowledge. Let's have a look. So it says uh, the knowledge of the test preparation activity five. So bookkeeping knowledge, so this task is to test your knowledge. Let's say, which one of the following would you expect to find the general ledger? As I said, we have a two types of ledger. One is individual ledger, that is represent individual customer or supplier, individual ledger account. For example, purchase ledger, that is individual supplier, or the sales ledger, individual customer. Also, we have the total balance, all the customer together, all the supplier together. We call it general ledger, GL. For example, sales ledger control and the purchase ledger control. All right, so let's have a look. Which of one of the following you expect uh, to find in the general ledger? Statement of profit, no purchase day book, no trial balance, no. This one, purchase ledger control account. This is my total, total balance outstanding from the credit supplier. So that means how much I need to pay to my supplier is the total balance. And this is my general balance, uh, general ledger, and it will give me the total outstanding to my supplier. Which one of the following best describes liabilities? So which one is the liabilities? Liabilities means is obligation I have to pay to the third party. The amount of cash injected by the owner, no, this is capital, isn't it? Ongoing expense, no, it's expense. Amount due from other parties, due from, very careful, from, no, it's not from. If it is due from other parties, this is my asset. If it is due from other parties, this is my asset. Amount O2, this is the one, to other parties, O, Two, I have to pay something to the other parties. This is my liability. This will be that one. All right, I think uh, this is uh, kind of the end of the chapter number two, and we will do two chapter today. And of course, like uh, we try to do all the activities we have, but remember at the end of the chapter, you have something called test your learning. So this is, is very important. You have to practice at home. It is, it is very important because if you can do yourself this, that means you understand all of this. So this is our end of uh, the session for uh, today.